this latest playbook breakfast. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Ryan Heath, author of the Brussels Playbook, and we are going to have a great hour coming up with Cecilia Malmström, the European Commissioner for Trade, who I think all of you know very, very well indeed. So first of all, thank you for coming along this morning. We started a bit early, but I think you will agree that worked out well in the end, given the heat that is um, upon us. And I give you all permission to take your jackets or your ties off if you're wearing them. Um, I might even take advantage of my own advice later on in the interview. Uh, firstly, we need to also thank our partner, Samsung, without whom we couldn't put on this event in this great venue. So thank you very much to Samsung. And you are also live on the internet right now. So thank you and welcome to everybody who is watching online. Um, that also means that maybe we've got several thousand people in the audience. There might be some trade negotiators in Korea, in Tokyo, probably also in Australia and New Zealand who are joining us right now as well. Um, we want to encourage you to participate in the session. So there will, of course, be an opportunity to ask questions from the floor, but we'll do a bit of an experiment today, and we're actually going to prioritize questions that come uh, online. So there is a system that you should all get familiar with if you didn't see the sign coming in, and that is a system called Slido. So if you go to the website sli.do and type in the code Playbook Breakfast, I think it's Playbook Breakfast, yes. Um, that's where you can pose questions online. We'll see them up here on the screen, and the point isn't to somehow uh, censor or control, it's to actually get through more questions, because you know how it is when you have to wait for mics to arrive at people, people sometimes are tempted to, to give long comments rather than questions. If we can do it via Slido, we get through more of your questions. And then, of course, if you've been to a Politico event before, you know that we're really keen to get your feedback and that we always try and tweak the events so that they get better next time. So you all have evaluation forms. I will gently harass you at the end of the event as well to make sure you fill them out and tell us what we did well, what we could do better, and who you'd like to hear from at the next event. And then, of course, we're going to have a breakfast afterwards, and there are some great Samsung installations, uh, and so we really encourage you to explore them uh, and check out their latest technology. So before uh, we begin the interview this morning, I want to invite up onto the stage Dr. Kwon, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Vice Chairman of Samsung Electronics and Head of Device Solutions. Dr. Kwon, please join me on stage. Thank you. Gentlemen, on behalf of Samsung Electronics, I would like to thank you for this honorable opportunity to give opening remarks Sorry as well as for the upcoming dis discussion with Commissioner Mellonstrom and Ryan. Today, I would like to briefly talk about the fast-changing IT business environment and trade regulations. Driven by continuous advancement and innovations, high-tech companies are creating IT ecosystems that are extremely dynamic, competitive, and interconnected. And these ecosystems are forming a complex global business system that is hard to predict. As a result, global corporations have faced an unprecedented level of uncertainty in the last decade. And they are dying younger than ever before. According to a study done by BCG, Boston Consulting Group, the average business lifespan of global companies today is around 30 years, nearly half of the, what it used to be in the 1970s. In the United States, the probability of a company to exit business in the next five years is around 30%, and the mortality rate continues to grow. Unfortunately, these trends are likely to continue for years to come as the new wave of uh, innovations, including 5G, Industry 4.0, and ever more sophisticated co convergence trend of hardware and software continues to disrupt the con competitive landscape. To make matters worse, the rising global protectionism trend could potentially have a devastating effect on this complex global business system and further increase corporate mortality. As such, 
policymakers need to be cautious in making and enforcing regulations on the IT industry. Nowadays, no company can survive alone. Technology companies create values through a complex web of partnerships and collaborative global supply chains. If government intervention becomes detrimental to these delicate ecosystems, much value can be destroyed. In this regard, the European Union has a distinguished achievement in coordinating politics to foster business ecosystems. And for this, we are very grateful to the European policymakers. Without the EU framework, we would be confronting a mosaic of different domestic rule sets, which would have resulted in painstakingly complicated trade agreements with the rest of the world. Their contributions to facilitating global IT trade will have a measurable impact on future technology innovations. And we would like to express our deepest respect for airports. And finally, congratulations in Europe, because uh, the last, uh, last few years, Europe is in very hard time and in uncertainty. But right now, politically, economically, Europe is back. Really good news for us. On, the, on that note, I have a hand over to Ryan and the Commissioner Melus Chen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. Commissioner Malmström. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Just Mr. quickly Ryan. before we get started, um, I want to make sure everyone understands this Slido system. So you will need your phones if you want to ask those questions. And you need to go to sli.do, enter in that Playbook Breakfast as the username, and then type in your question. And, it will, and you also have the opportunity to say if you like someone else's question, and the ones that are most popular, they'll be the ones that rise to the top of the screen that we see here. But let's get straight into it. <laughs> I've, I've already ditched the jacket and, and, and taken my own advice. Um, now, Commissioner Maltram, I don't know if you know, but you're very big in Montana. In Montana? Yes. All right. I, I did my research, and you are perhaps the only commissioner to share your name with an American Air Force base and a discount store. So I don't okay. know what your family did 100 to 150 years ago, but um, you're very popular over there in Montana. It could be your trump card in the, the U.S. trade negotiations. Ooh, <laughs> I'll take note of that. All right. Thank you. Okay. But let's get into to something serious. Um, I think when we were getting ready for this that interview... That was serious. That's that was very, very serious. Very yes. serious. Very serious. Um, Brexit talks got underway yesterday. Um, do you have any first reactions to how it went? Well, it was a full day. Uh, and they, uh, I think it was a closed door, and they came out and they said they had agreed on the next meeting. Yeah. Well, that, that's progress. It could be worse. Well, I've been to trialogues <laughs> in the European Parliament for several hours where we haven't got that far. So, yes, I, I think that okay. is progress, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and have you figured out what you might offer Mr. Fox, Liam Fox, for your gift when you get those trade negotiations underway? Well, we're not there yet. I think uh, we need to uh, get these negotiations ongoing. I think uh, also there are some formalities back in the UK mm -hmm. with a formal announcement of the new, gov new old government and its program, and then they has to be started, and uh, the, the, the possible trade negotiations will not start yet. Mm -hmm. But we are, of course, I mean, they are still members, so we meet in different council constellations mm -hmm. and different meetings and, and so on, like, like before. And the UK government has just appointed, in case people haven't followed this piece of news over the weekend, a man called Crawford Faulkner to be their top international trade negotiator. Um, we haven't you welcome the competition? Uh, you, you <laughs> we haven't uh, been able to talk yet, but okay. Uh, absolutely. Okay, okay. Um, and Liam Fox is on a tour in the US as well. So it strikes me that he, he might be walking up close to the line about what he's allowed to do before uh, Brexit actually takes place in terms of his trade negotiating. Do you have any red lines for Mr. Fox? Or <laughs> uh, <laughs> is he getting close to those red lines if you don't want to specify them? 
Well, they are still members of the European Union, so obviously they cannot negotiate trade agreements before they actually leave. And that I think they, they know and our partners know, and a lot of our lawyers out there know that as well. Uh, but, but I think it's quite natural that they sort of explore a little bit the territory, that they put themselves in contact with their biggest economic partners, obviously the US and a few others. Uh, you know, not negotiating, but you know, start preparing the ground a little bit. Obviously, if they were to start to negotiate, that would really be breaking a red line, but I don't think they will. Uh, so, so there's no real harm in, in them exploring a little bit. Um, it, because they have to do that. They will leave almost 40 trade, trade agreements that we have negotiated on their behalf, and they are members of that. So, of course, they will have to do their, their own trade agreements. So uh, maybe not all 40 are a priority for them, but, but some of them uh, will definitely be, so that they start listening around, uh, reaching out. Uh, I think that, that, that is within the red lines. Good, good. Well, let, let's broaden it out and bring it back to, to you a little bit more. I, was, I wanted to sort of put a theory or a thought to you, and that is that as Commissioner for Trade, um, I think you, you know, it's almost like you're the face of hard power for the European Commission. I wouldn't, Ooh. Margaret Vestager, <laughs> I think she obviously has I some hard power yeah, as well. I think she is, she's quite hard power yeah, as but well. But she can't right? really talk about her hard power in the way that you can, so you're a more interesting interview. No, but she radiates hard power, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do? You're not radiating, you're pulsing it, it's pulsating. Yeah, I'm more... Discreet. <laughs> Discreet. Okay. Okay. Well, that's terrible news for this interview, but is we're going to have to oh. get you restart. <laughs> uh, but the, the point I wanted to make is you have this hard power, but you're also under pressure from a lot of different mm -hmm. angles. We have the Trump era that's emerged. Mr. Macron has his own uh, ideas that might not always be in a line with yours, Brexit and so on. Um, is it fair to say that you, you at once have this power, but you're also sort of circled a little bit by these other pressures? Well, yes, but, but also even without all these uh, challenges, we are, because yes, the European Union, the Commission, negotiate trade agreements with other countries. We represent EU in the WTO. We are the, the face of this, but we are, can't do that without support from the member states. I cannot start one single trade negotiation without having a mandate given to me unanimously by the member states. Mm -hmm. And once we start negotiations, we have to talk to, to them and report all the time, before and after, and as well as the, the European uh, Parliament, the intercommittee there. And then, as there has been quite a lot of um, public debate on trade mm -hmm. lately, uh, we are also trying to really engage with civil society, with business, uh, and, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Quo for his, his and his country and his uh, company's engagement in that. But also, you know, trade unions, mm -hmm. um, environmental organizations, consumer organizations. Yesterday I had a long meeting with, with ETUC, the, the, uh, uh, the trade union organization here to discuss uh, those aspects as, as well. So yes, we are under constant uh, pressure to, to, to do this, but that's part of, yep. of the job, of course. Uh, and, and do you feel that... It's not that my personal, you know, agenda. Of course, going of course. But, but in a way, you must have shaped it in some way, where I, mm. if, we, if we wind the clock back a little bit to something like ACTA, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that struck me as trade diplomacy that At was kind worst. of stuck yeah, in a different era. Yeah. And that, so I, I guess I'm asking, um, do your officials get that they've needed to change, and how have you... How have you changed how you do your own work, given um, you know, you've experienced populism via the Home Affairs portfolio, you've experienced it through uh, some of the more difficult trade stuff in the first couple of years of your mandate. So how has that changed, and are, you, are your officials changing the way they work? Yes, I mean, I think one of the most important thing, and that, that's probably also because of my, my background uh, as a Swede, that, that I really wanted to increase the transparency in the trade negotiations. Of course, you cannot solve the most difficult final items in front of the TV cameras, everybody realizes, but there's a lot you can publish. There's a lot you can make, um, you, you can share uh, with others. So I think I have contributed to more transparency in trade negotiations. Uh, and once you open that box, you can't really close it. So that is hopefully safe also for my, 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 <laughs> my, my predecessors, my, my successors. Uh, and we've also tried to do trade uh, much more value-based because we are the biggest trader in the world, the European Union. We're the biggest exporter, importer, investor. We have responsibility. And people want to know who, who made this, under what conditions. Uh, 
child, children, uh, how are the work, uh, working conditions? No, but you, 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 know, you would like to feel comfortable that this yeah. is at least decent. So we have a responsibility to do that, to try to push for sustainable, uh, fair trade as much as possible. And also underline what, what we, we cannot make the world democratic overnight, but we can contribute a little bit. And that is what I've tried to, to also do in, in our, our, uh, our trade uh, negotiations. So inclusiveness, transparency, value-based, th these are the things I've hoped to, to sort of imp impose on, on, on trade. And that is necessary because people want to be, they demand to be involved. Well, these are all words that mm. remind me of President Trump. These, these seems to be like I, the lit motif <laughs> of his uh, administration. No, so you, you wouldn't say that's what characterizes Trump. What, what, what does characterize that administration and their approach to trade? Well, it's still a bit confusing, I must say. Uh, we, we don't know their, their, their full long-term trade agenda. What we have seen so far are a few promises from the trade campaign where he delivers what he said, withdrawing from TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, renegotiating NAFTA, that will start now in, in August, and then some uh, executive orders and proposals that, from our point of view, are going in, in a very protectionist direction. I mean, reinforcing by America, mm -hmm. which will make public procurement much more difficult, reinforcing some laws also in, for instance, in the Jones Act. There are talks now, any day there will be announcement maybe on how to uh, protect certain, certain items, not to be steal from, from, uh, from uh, imports using a, a very old provision in, 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 the, in, in the American law on uh, 232 on security screening, which I think would be detrimental. Yeah, well, l let's sit for a minute on the, the idea of the 232 decision. So for anyone who's not familiar, section 232, that is essentially the US, if they were to take a decision under that section of their law, it would allow them to use a national security loophole to, for example, mm. impose tariffs on mm. European steel. steel. Because there are tariffs already on Chinese steel, but not on European steel. Um, that could come any day now. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the start of a trade war if they trigger that? Well, we should be very careful in using that word, but, but it is definitely not a good sign mm. because uh, we, we, we are not the biggest steel producers of the world. China is, and, and we, we share with the US a concern of uh, China's um, policy when it comes to, to, to subsidizing big, quite old-fashioned, some of them, state-owned companies and dumping global prices. So this is an issue where EU and US has been working hand-in-hand, hand, also with some other countries, to stop uh, these unfair practices and to have a dialogue with the Chinese on how we can help them in, in a transition. Uh, but but uh, Chinese steel imports in US and EU are now subject to a lot of anti-dumping, so there's quite a lot, um, little happening. So, of course, if that is done, maybe it's maybe not targeted vis-a-vis -vis Europe, but it will hit us very hard. And, and our companies, so, so that, that is unfortunate. But you, would but you would have to respond in some way, there. Will, otherwise yes. all the steel will flood onto the European market. And then that we will have to respond, and, and we, we have of course expressed our concerns to the US administration, uh, both from the European institutions, myself, and I know many other countries, especially the steel producing countries have. So we will have to see what, what is in this legislation, of course, but, but yes, somehow we will have to react, but yeah. that we will see uh, afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you go, further than Liam Fox does in saying that. I think last night he had said, well, he was almost sucking up to the US administration, is my objective journalistic um, assessment of that situation, where he, he was refusing to comment at all on section 232. Um, and that struck me as a little bit um, weak <laughs> on his part. Well, um uh, on behalf of the European uh, Union, and we have, of course, talked to our member, member countries about this, uh, I think we, I mean, I'm less shy. I think we should uh, be, be very, very clear in that is not targeting the European Union in its thoughts, maybe, because I think we are allies, we are friends, almost all EU countries are members of NATO, so we are security allies as well, and this is um, hitting the European Union very, very hard. There you go, if radiating hard power. You, you, you can do it, <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, sorry. Um, so maybe a little bit broader on TTIP. Um, TTIP. What would it take to? Oh, you've forgotten TTIP. Yeah. We've moved on. That's Sorry. another. That's one of these Very acronyms perfect. I put in the hard disk <laughs> somewhere. Yes. So, so we we can't defrost that hard disk at all. There's, what would it take to defrost TTIP? Well, 
I think we, we could, but uh, for the moment, we have put it in the freezer, in the fridge, or in the cupboard. You can put it wherever you want, but, but that we knew a we Samsung would do. A Samsung fridge, a Samsung fridge. Absolutely, right. absolutely, yes. <laughs> uh, and they, they defrost themselves, uh, if you program them right. Uh, so, so maybe that is the solution, <laughs> actually, yes. Uh, but, I mean, when there is a change in the US administration, even if there had been another president, there would have been a break in this, because yeah. there's always a natural pause in all these big negotiations while the new administration comes into terms and defines their priorities. So what we did the 19th of January, just before the, the, uh, the exit of the Obama administration, was to put all the papers nice in order where, we, where we, we were. And then we said we would wait for the next administration to have a look at it and see. The US administration is still not fully in place. US TAR is not full yet. The deputy and there are lots of, of political posts there and also in the Department of Commerce, uh, they're not fully there. So we have you know, flagged that we are willing to, to sit and discuss technically, see where we are, where were we, uh, so on. But I think we're not really ready to do that, either of us yet. And of course, if we were to defrost it, we would no, need to know under what circumstances. Because as I said, there has been a lot of, of quite protectionist proposals lately from the US that sort of changes a little bit the, 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 the game plan. Mm. Um, so we would have to, to discuss internally in the EU and with them, of course, where, where are we, where are we going, are we taking it out exactly as we left it, probably not. Mm. Are there other things we could do? For the moment, it doesn't seem to be one of the priorities of the US administration. They are prioritizing NAFTA now and a few other things. Uh, and we have, and maybe we'll come to that, I mean, we have around, you know, we have 10 really intensive negotiations going on right now. I mean, Japan, Mexico, yeah, Mexico, so basically. we, we, we keep ourselves busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's quite extraordinary the, the way there are still all of these unfilled positions in the US administration. I mean, did you have any unfilled positions five months after you began as trade commissioner or you were... No, but it's a, it's a different system. I mean, the, the U.S. sometimes it does take a lot of time. I hear from my U.S. experts, and you would know that from your journalist colleagues, that this is, this is a little longer than the average, but usually it does take six months yep. before everybody is filled. Mm -hmm. But there, there's work to do. So. Yep. And your counterpart, or one of your counterparts, mm -hmm. Mr. Ross, um, in the Commerce Department, mm -hmm. um, he seems quite obsessed with trade deficits. I, I mean, I, I haven't met with him, so uh, clarify for us if, if you think that's an unfair assessment. Um, given that, you know, is there any scope to do anything like sectoral agreements, or is that just a level of ambition that is not, it's not, not worth your time? No, there could be, uh, because uh, th there's a lot of red tape within different sectors where we, do, we duplicate our... our um, uh, our certificate procedures, where we inspect our factories for um, medical devices, basically the same way, with the same standards and so on, but we have to do it twice. In the car sector, there's a lot of testing that is basically done the same way, but still you have to do it twice. So there are a few areas in the chemical, in the medical devices, in the car sector, where, maybe in cosmetics, where we could actually you know, recognize some of our testing methods or some of the, 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 the standards, which would get away with a lot of red tape, which costs a lot of money for companies. That could be something to explore. But again, we're not there yet. Uh, and that would be a win-win. That's a sign of hope. Mm. So there is hope in the Trump administration. Always look at the bright side. <laughs> okay, yes. Determined optimism. I think that was the phrase we got out of the Brexit talk. Optimism is a duty, as Karl Popper said. <laughs> oh, I'm losing my mind. Uh, well, on, on a related note, um, you're obviously also in talks with Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that they're keen to cut a deal because they're afraid of what is happening north of the, the border? Like, in a sense, are we, are you Mexico's diversification strategy? <laughs> are we there, teddy bear? Um, well, we had started with Mexico before. We have an older trade agreement with Mexico. It's 17 years old. It has worked well, but it's old-fashioned. So we decided long before we knew who would be in the White House today that we would update it. Uh, and that work has started. But I think it's fair to say that, that uh, we have decided jointly to intensify talks. For them, it's probably I mean, economically important. We are an important economic partner, uh, but also geopolitically important to show that they can strike other deals and diversify their dependence from, from, from the US. But also globally, I think there is a willingness today from countries uh, who believe in trade, who believe in fair trade, who believe that trade can be a win-win, not I win and you lose, uh, and who believe in open markets, uh, multilateral rules, to stick together. 
and Mexico and EU are obvious partners. We also have Japan, South Korea. Uh, we, we are negotiating with the Mercosur countries. We will soon start with your oh, homeland, yeah. uh, Australia, <laughs> New Zealand, Chile. We negotiate with Indonesia. I mean, th there is, I think th there has been a sense of urgency that we need to stick together and to show that, that yes, trade is actually good for people, but you need to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. And with that, I also mean increased transparency, increased inclusiveness. We are a lot of countries coming together to talk about how we can do more progressive trade. Canada is the obvious example. Mm -hmm. They have a very progressive government. We work closely with them uh, in order to, to also promote sustainable development, um, the role of trade unions, um, environment, uh, etc. Et so. Now, might be time to bring in some audience questions. I don't see any Slido questions yet, so I <laughs> encourage you. Oh, we, got a, we have a question <laughs> up the back for Lena in the green dress. If someone wants to just pass that microphone over. <laughs> it's Lena Abarus from Eurafrex. Um, hello, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for this amazing uh, day and uh, to start uh, such a powerful uh, trade talks. How many uh, trade agreements you will be able to sign by the end of this year? Ooh. <laughs> well, uh, we have. Uh, we hope that the Canadian agreement will enter into force very soon. That that is, uh, uh, you know, signed uh, when it comes to the provisional application. So that I hope will uh, happen very soon. We also hope that our Singapore agreement will enter into force by the end of the year. Um, I mentioned three priorities where we are negotiating, Japan, Mexico, and Mercosur. With good political effort, uh, and that is really our aim and our partners aim, we could politically um, wind them up this year. But to sign them, then you have to have every technical thing uh, ready. I'm not sure that that will be the case, but I hope politically those three, at least Japan and Mexico, uh, hopefully also Mercosur, can be politically agreed this year. Okay, and let's take a question from the Slido system. So the first question from AEB, whoever that is, is how do you see the recent European Court of Justice ruling on the Singapore Free Trade Agreement, uh, and do you see it impacting the Commission's approach to future trade Ooh, agreements? Sorry. So I think they mean the, the mm. splitting of the agreements there. Well, that could be one, one way out of it. Uh, the, the court... Uh, was very clear. We had asked the court, using Singapore as an example, uh, w to basically ask them where, where is the competence of the European Union and where is the, 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 the mixed competence uh, on this. And that the, the statement was very clear. It said that basically everything in the free trade agreement is EU competence, meaning that we, and that, that is important, how do you decide? So that meaning that, that the member states with the qualified majority and the European Parliament majority can ratify it and then it enters into force. Then there is a part on, on portfolio investment and investment protection that is shared competence. Um, that is not EU only, that, that where member states need to decide by unanimity. So that was very clear. Now, what do we do with that statement? Well, we have to decide. Uh, I mean, it's not for the Commission to decide. It is for, for, for the member states and the European Parliament. So we just started those discussions uh, and see how, what effect. One way would, could be to divide the trade agreements into trade and, and investment either always or on a case-by-case -case basis, but this is something that we just started to discuss. The lawyers are looking at the, every little comma of the statement. Our lawyers, the European Parliament, uh, the, 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 the Council Legal Services, and they are, are sharing notes and so on, and I hope we will soon have a political possibility to discuss with the ministers. And uh, is it a coincidence that the German elections are in September? Is it I think maybe handy that you wait until after the German elections for that discussion? No, I mean, it has started already, but we haven't had uh, the possibility on a ministerial level to discuss it yet, because there is no, uh, there is no minister meeting planned uh, for this. But we, of course, informally, there, there's a lot of discussions uh, on this. So, so uh, uh, I hope that we can, can use that and that we can have a, a good outcome. Also, because of the, the predictability, the credibility of the European Union. I mean, it's not... Of course, national parliaments need to be involved. It's a question of when and how. And I think member states, and if there's one thing we have learned from the whole Canadian CETA Valonia debate, is that member states need to engage with their national or regional or even local entities at a much earlier state, not 5 to, to, to 12. 
Um, so, of course, they need to be engaged, but the question is at, at what stage? And if we can have more clarity on that, on the procedures, I think our, our partners would be relieved as well, because they were, of course, looking at us. Well, of course, we, we negotiate a deal six, seven years, and then, you know, can you ratify it with one region, block mm. it? Uh, I mean... Well, maybe that brings us to my homeland, Australia, and to New Zealand as well, mm. because if we were, or you were, to choose what that sort of splitting model mm -hmm. in some way, it's probably better to do that from the outset of an agreement rather than, like you say, five minutes to midnight. Arriving yes, yes, or yes, reverse probably, engineering yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, uh, we can, I, I was going to get to the Japan agreement, but we can, we can come to that in a minute. Thought maybe if we come back a little bit closer to home. Oh, we did, no, let's go to Japan. There's a question I take there it back, Japan. there's a question yeah. right there. Um, so from <coughs> Anonymous, very shy <coughs> person, uh, what is the legal practical and political value of a political agreement on the FTA with Japan? Well, politically, uh, it's, as I said, um, it is bringing us closer to a country with whom we share a lot of values. It's a country with whom we cooperate in G7, G20, uh, in different other international organizations. It is a very powerful economic um, entity with whom we, we trade, but there are lots of obstacles. Mm -hmm. So if we can get away with a lot of tariffs, we would save billions just getting away with tariffs. If we can um, uh, increase our possibilities to trade, for instance, in agriculture, where we have very offensive interest in the, in the, uh, on the Japanese market that would be good for European farmers and, and our industry. Uh, for our car industry, we also see possibilities. Obviously, the Japanese sees possibilities here as well. So, so th that could re lead to... Uh, it could be the biggest deal ever done, if you can land this. Yes. Well, not... Sorry, uh, Canada. Yeah. <laughs> So, so that, that would be I mean, an economic value and a, a, a political value. And also it is uh, at, uh, associated to a, um, um, a, a association agreement as well. So, so that, that is a bigger framework where we can cooperate on a lot of other things with Japan. So it brings us closer to each other because trade is, is, is good for, for, for the economy and for the companies, but it also brings people closer. Mm -hmm. um, and th that is a good thing. Now, two concerns I've heard about the Japanese agreement are that it might not include the investment court idea that you've previously floated, and data flows or, or data trade might be excluded from the agreement. Can you give us any clues on those? Well, we are working on both of these issues. Uh, the, the, the new version of investment protection that we have in the Canadian agreement, uh, in the Vietnam agreement, uh, and hopefully uh, soon in the Singapore agreement, is the agreement that member states in the European Parliament want us to, to, to be doing. And we, and we have explained that very thoroughly to, to the Japanese. We are not there yet. Um, because they have a, a, a different system, so we are still uh, comparing and discussing and, and, and see on. So, so I hope that we can find a, a solution there, but that chapter is not closed yet. And on, and on you can't just sort of pick the privacy shield off the shelf and paste that into the Japanese context? Well, th we are th that we are discussing as well with the European Parliament and, and the member states, because of course we need to, to trade with data, absolutely. Uh, but we need to find the right balance in trading with data have, uh, and make sure that we protect the, the, the personal data as well. We have the privacy shield with the US and we have the new uh, data protection um, regulation and, uh, entering into force, I think, early next year. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's no intention to, to, to negotiate data protection. We just need to see how we can, can fit that in. And that is also one of the, the, the ongoing uh, discussions where we're not fully there yet. And on the practicalities, because I think, I mean, I'm a little ignorant myself, I would say, but I think if you're not in this trade world, um, you, you don't realize how complicated some of this is. Mm -hmm. So let's like, imagine it's successful. You get the political agreement in July, just before the G20. Um, it could take one or two years to finalize all those extra details, couldn't it? You could no, almost be... No, I don't think so. But, but, but if we get it done, uh, and I mean substance before timing, but, but our, the highest political leaders, uh, President Juncker and, and Prime Minister Abe, have pronounced their willingness to see if they can you know, conclude it as soon as possible, maybe this summer, on a political level. If that were to happen, we will still have some political... Uh, some Technical and political agreements, left. but but that I think we can. But it's more six to twelve months, not one to two years. No, 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 no. It is more half a year, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Mm. okay. Um, now let's let's come a little bit closer to home. Um, we've got this guy, Emmanuel Macron. Mm -hmm. He's uh, 
Yeah. Got a new job. Le président de la République. Mm? Uh, yes, yes, small promotion. Um, <laughs> so I um, wanted to ask you about him because he also has some interesting ideas on trade. So he wants better trade defense, let's say, in mm -hmm. general. But some specific examples, uh, he'd like to see foreign investment screening. He, like the French presidents before him, has always had a bit of a thing about reciprocity rules. And he specifically floated this idea of a bi-European act. So Ooh. my question to you is, is this new European hero <laughs> forcing you to become more protectionist than you would like to be? <laughs> well, I think many of us welcome very much the election of, of our president uh, Macron and now the, 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 um, the, the parliamentary elections are over as well. So there will be you know, the, the, the formalization of a government and we will start to, 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 to liaise with them. We haven't had that possibility yet. And I think the president is planning to come or is, of course, coming to, to the summit this week. And some of these disc, uh, issues will be discussed. We have um, had already uh, a lot of trade defense um, instruments that we have been, uh, had to use this, this last um, year, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, because the situation is quite, um, is quite exceptional. So we are using the trade de defense instruments we have. We have also asked the legislators to, to agree on our proposal to update them. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, I think we will have the support of President uh, Macron as well to make sure that we can act quicker, that we can engage with the industry uh, at, at an earlier stage, that we can shorten a little bit the, the investigation, and that we are you know, more modern and, and efficient. Uh, and that, I hope that the parliament and the, uh, they are in, in trialogue now, so I hope that that can, can agree. And that would satisfy some of his issues. And also, of course, to create a better level playing field, that is the whole purpose of negotiating. The most difficult countries we are negotiating with on this is China, obviously, uh, where we are trying to, to have more reciprocity in our negotiations. I think I've used that word also vis-a-vis -vis our, our Chinese So he's a help in that respect, because Sorry? he... he he helps you in one he, respect. Well, he helps he and he underlines uh, this as well. And then, I mean, he has some, some other ideas as well. I think we need to, to see what, what, what more d in detail does he mean with, with that. Um, the, the investment um, uh, screening is something that, or th that we will have to, to look at what, what is legally possible to do in the European uh, level, what is desirable to that do. Sounds well, I wouldn't classify his ideas into normal and not normal, but the investment screening, that at least has precedence. You know, there are other countries that have these review boards and so on. Yes, and many member states have their own le uh, national legislation. So maybe we, we should see what, what can you do uh, nationally, how can we do best practices, how can we compare. I think we, we re these are sensitive because we, we want investment as well. We don't want to hurt investment. Investment has been good for Europe. So we need to see the right balance there and I, I'm looking forward to, to hear some more detail of his proposals there. I think they will be discussed at the European Summit because there are I some proposed so, uh, line in the, in the proposed uh, conclusions. So, so there will be a first discussion and then we'll have to see where to take and, it from And will there. you join for those discussions or have free no, meetings? No, that is beyond my pay grade. I don't go to European councils anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, we've got some more questions down here. Um, from M. Ray Pecker from the Wall Street Journal. He asks, what will it take for the EU-China investment agreement to move forward? How mm. can the EU address the investment reciprocity issue in the absence of that deal? Well, we just touched upon that. that. That is, I mean, honestly, it's very difficult because we are negotiating an investment agreement with China. The whole purpose is to create a better level playing field or more reciprocity if mm. you... Si vous voulez parler français. Um, and that, that is the aim. We just had a summit with the Chinese where we said we would like to, to um, go, you know, advance a little bit in these notes negotiation, exchange offers, and so on. I, I think the Chinese agree with that, but we haven't come to a timetable on this. So it's advancing, but at a quite slow uh, pace. And we're also engaging with them on different other foras, on, on uh, steel fora and, and so on. So it, it is slow, uh, I would have to say, but we don't really know other ways than, than to keep on talking and, and dialoguing. That's the EU way. Boring and slow, but uh, when it works, it's sufficient. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you've s almost touched on this, but maybe this is asking for a little bit more detail on uh, does EU exclusive competence for foreign direct investment allow it to legislate on investment screening? That I can't answer because that is very complicated because mm -hmm. it, it's broad. That we need to do the legal analysis of this. What is EU competence? What is member states competence? What is share competence? Uh, and th that, that is uh, quite complicated. Mm -hmm. So we need, uh, we need and thorough legal. Is it purely legal a legal decision where the legal service 
no, no, it's actually dictate I mean, first, what will happen or first you have a political we need to know, get the legal advice on this. Then, of course, there's also, this is politically very sensitive, mm -hmm. but, but we need to, do, need to know legally what we do um, at the same time as we discuss it politically. So, so this is something that I think we, we have just started to put on the agenda. Mm -hmm. We should shred carefully here because it's, it's, uh, it is sensitive, um, but we need to get the, the legal and the political uh, right, and I think there are different views between member states on this as well. Mm -hmm. And while we're thinking on these uh, China-related topics, uh, we were both in Davos together at the World Economic mm -hmm. Forum. President Xi gave that quite extraordinary speech Absolutely, on globalization, yeah. and, and I mean that in all senses of the word. Um, how, much, how much does the EU have to do the heavy lifting before China is fully ready to, to match those words from President Xi? Because I think they were, they were fine words. They were really fine words, and that was an excellent speech. Uh, we liked the content, and we, I mean, I think also rhetorically, rhetorically it was a beautiful speech. Uh, but we, now we need them to walk the talk, uh, because what, what he said that we all welcome. And if China were to take that leadership and uh, move towards a stronger role in, in, in getting rid of, of trade obstacles uh, and so on, we would all welcome it. But we haven't seen that. On the contrary, we've seen some quite... Uh, new proposals that in making European investment there more complicated and, and difficult. Uh, European investment is going down in China, which is very worrying. So we hope that they can walk the talk. Uh, I know that they have uh, a, a difficult political internal year in front of them with the party congress in October mm -hmm. and so on with different you know, complications as, as always uh, on this. So, so maybe later this, uh, this fall we will have more clarity. Well, they've got it easy in some respects because they only do a five-year budget. Yeah, exactly. You, you yeah. have to do with a seven-year budget. So. Well, so far, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's um, talk on one final issue before we get a bit into ways of working of the Commission, and that's on this idea of the multilateral investment court. Mm -hmm. um, you've had ministerial discussion yep. about it. Um, it was clearly a quite innovative way to, to move forward from a really tough mm -hmm. political debate. I mean, people were not happy about um, the, the existing system. So um, can you give us a bit of an update? Who's, who is kind of on board? Who is only interested? Will the UK consider signing up? What's the state of play? Well, this is an attempt to move away from the old uh, bilateral investment agreement, the old ISDS system. ISDS turned out to be quite a toxic uh, acronym, but also not only the acronym, but it, it really lead, led to a lot of protests and so on, which I can understand because the system is, is outdated. And even if it has basically worked, there has been some things that have not worked, and there are loopholes that we need to, to in 2017, we need to, to, to repair. So the idea was that we could maybe move all these 3,400 agreements that exist all over the world, so this is a debate that is not only ongoing in Europe, and have an international court that could deal with them, with proper judges who are, are totally independent, with high ethical standards, who would look at this, where there would be an appeal mechanism, where there would be full transparency, and a sort of court-like system, and that would replace. And we have had meetings on, on ambassador level and on ministerial level. I mean, countries like Canada and Argentina uh, are, are fully on board. Many countries have expressed their, their, their support for the idea, but they want to, to know more. Others are a little bit more careful. So far, the Who's UK... more careful? Well, those who, who have the, the old system, like the, the US, for instance, they think that their system has worked well. Um, they, um, the UK have not... I mean, they, have, they are backing the European Union, so they are, of course, fully supporting uh, this and uh, as, as, as a member state. If they would have another position as in, you know, after Brexit, I, I don't know. I don't think so. They've been very supportive uh, on this. Uh, and we had a meeting with ministers in, in Davos, where, where we were. There were around 30 ministers. And most of them expressed their, their support. So now we are uh, organizing an event the 10th of July with UNCITRAL, which is the United Nations um, Trade um, uh, Forum to have a discussion on this with ministers of well, there, the whole world is a member of that, to see how we can move forward. We will have new meetings uh, this fall as well. So it's slowly, I spoke with the, the, um, the European uh, Trade Union organization on this as well. They are also, you know, trying to, to find ways to, to, to support and to, to, uh, to be with you, with us on this. So it's moving forward, but we need to, the whole world, to. it cannot be, this is what the European Union you know, thinks you can join or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that I can get a mandate uh, by the end of the year to, you know, with the main components to start a more 
you know, active negotiation on this as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I, someone is uh, very keen to have the question asked. I, I think you touched on it a little bit before, um, but it's going back to this US um, security and steel mm -hmm. issue. How would the EU respond to a section 232 decision? Well, I can't tell you because first of all, we need to see what's in that proposal. Mm -hmm how it is uh, designed, if, who, who is targeted and why, and then we need to discuss this with member states. But of course, we will have to respond uh, in different means. Um, so you, you, will, you will see. Mm -hmm. And we've got a question I haven't thought of before, so well done, uh, Anonymous. Um, how will Brexit negotiations impact current FTA negotiations, especially regarding something called TRQ concessions, mm -hmm. I admit full ignorance of this, in the agriculture sector, in Mercosur agreement. That is the quotas, the ah, trade ah. quotas. Yeah, TRQ, oh, that can make you sleepless. Uh, this is really well, for us nerds. Might, might, <laughs> who might, might make you go to sleep Don't well, get me you know. there. Huh? <laughs> TRQs, that is really something for Friday night. Um, for the moment, it doesn't affect at all. They, we negotiate on behalf of the 28. Uh, our, our, our partners are, of course, aware that the UK will leave us. Um, and that they went to eventually will seek a, a new trade agreement. But for the moment, this has not, uh, I think the example here was from Mercosur, mm -hmm. there has not been, been an issue. We, we negotiate uh, as, as, as strong as this, and we haven't seen any demands on the TRQs, on the trade quotas now, I feel uh, in agriculture sorry. to be, be there. I'm feeling they, are, they are complicated as they are. Well, I'm feeling slightly guilty to make another Brexit question here, but <laughs> it is a good one, so I'm going to ask it, and it's from Malcolm Harbour, the, the former MEP from Absolutely, the UK. Absolutely, an old the, colleague and friend. Indeed, yes. indeed. So Malcolm has asked, or Malcolm points out, that Boris Johnson has claimed that the EU was weak on trade and services, and that this is the UK's opportunity post-Brexit. How would you respond to that thought from Boris Johnson? Uh, well... Um, I think we have achieved a quite advanced level of trading services with our, our most advanced agreement with South Korea, for instance, but also on, um, uh, with Canada, where is really the, the very advanced on this. Um, th this is always complicated because sometimes in services you touch upon sensitive areas in, in the countries. It could be maritime services. We talked about data flows. Uh, and so on, but, but these things are sensitive and difficult, and I think um, Mr. Johnson will experience that, that these things are not mm -hmm. uh, very easy. Uh, and then also many countries want not only to trade in services, but also those who provide services, people. Mm -hmm. How can we facilitate for people? Uh, so this is a challenge for Boris well, Johnson to possibly discover not that, by limiting migration to the that, uh, yeah. that demand will pop up in some of the, the trading. Of course, we can always do better, uh, but, but I think on, on our two best trade agreements so far with, um, with South Korea and with, uh, with, uh, with Canada, I think we can be proud of the result. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple of questions, because you're going to, to leave very quickly after this event for a very good reason. Um, so uh, I heard that you were baking cakes on Friday, or that you were in a cake factory at the very least with your <laughs> team. Uh, I was not baking, I was eating. <laughs> eating, okay. T tell, tell us a little bit about that. Um, <laughs> Uh, it might have been almond cakes was the, the tip Yes, that I got. well, I had a, a, um, a team building with my, my fantastic cabinet, and we were in uh, the city of Göteborg, which is my home city in, in Sweden, uh, who is very much trade-oriented. They've been trading since the, the 17th, uh, well, since ages, but, but very active in, in trade. Mm. Um, and there they have uh, the biggest port in Scandinavia, which we visited, and a, um, a bakery. They sell almond cakes that they export. They froze them, and they export to 34 countries, I think. Uh, so we were given, you know, a, a bit on the ground. How does export work? What are the problems? Uh, how do you deal with cultural differences? Some countries, like in the Arab countries, want them more sweet, other ones less sugar. You have almonds, yeah, they have to be halal, they have to be gluten, they are different. I mean, all these things uh, from a quite small company. Um, I mean, how 120 employed? I mean, not, not much. Um, so they, they gave us, you know, a little lesson on how trade functions for them on a daily basis. And then it ended up with a visit in the factory and we could also taste some of their cakes. So that was good. Mm -hmm. Now, a final question about how trade functions for women, because yes. I think you're off to uh, I am. I'm hosting and I'm very happy to do that. I'm hosting together uh, with um, the, the um, International Center of Trade. 
uh, a, a conference with guests from all over the world on women and trade, because I think this is something we have not given enough attention. So we want to hear examples of how trade affects women, how trade can, can help women all over the world, and if there are things in trade we could do to, to support women in a better way. Excellent. Well, Commissioner Malmstrom, I think it's time to wrap it up there. All right. Um, I think, well, maybe I've got it wrong. Have we got any more time? No. no it's time <laughs> to wrap it up. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate you. your candid answers and your, um, your speed with your answers. We got through quite a lot there. Um, so I think before we uh, say goodbye, I have got a couple of more housekeeping remarks. Um, so <laughs> always very, very important to follow these housekeeping remarks. Um, <laughs> so thank you, Commissioner <laughs> Malmstrom. I got the first point right. Thank very you. good. Um, <laughs> Thanks once again to our partner and to you, Dr. Kwam, for the very interesting remarks at the beginning. Of course, thank you to everyone watching online um, because we know it's not always easy to, to keep glued to those screens for a whole hour, but I'm pretty sure we got some high viewing numbers for this one. Uh, thank you here in the audience for all of your questions and those who, who use the Slido system. I found it very useful. Um, I hope you did as well. Um, of course, we've got the networking breakfast that is going to take place now. If, you aren't running off to a Women in Trade event. Um, and then uh, please check out the demonstrations, the technology demonstrations that we have as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us at this latest Playbook Breakfast. <laughs>